Hogwarts school was in danger. At least that's what you all supposed. It had just felt like any ordinary day in the wizarding world, as far as ordinary could have been, with a nice early rise, coffee by your dorm window, and some of your favourite classes ahead in which to participate. With the support of Harry, Ron, and Hermione, you'd cobbled together an impressive potion in Snape's class, extracted a little bizarre goo in Miss Sprout's herbology, and all was well in your world. That was until Ron recalled a hooded figure lurking around the cellar door. A figure which you then saw with your very own eyes and recognised to be Professor Quirrell. This sighting swelled great worry in you. For you all knew that within the cellar lay something of unfathomable importance and secrecy. Before embarking on your pursuit, you went to confide in Hagrid. Dumbledore, as wise and all-knowing, as he was, was equally concerned to hear of these strange sightings. But his heart told him that the destiny of what slept within the cellar lay in the hands of four others. Professor McGonagall was less convinced but trusted his judgement. All that was left to see was how the events would unfold. The safety of Hogwarts School was now in the hands of four brave students. But just how brave would they turn out to be? Welcome to Snooze with Sam, as we continue our journey through the Chronicles of Hogwarts. There they were, headed out to Hagrid's hut. Somewhere nearby, lurking and sliding around the shadows of the Forbidden Forest, a set of eyes watched their every move. They crawled across fallen logs, slithered along branches and melted from dark corner to dark corner. All the while, the four witches and wizards unaware, they thought they were alone, but they were wrong. As they neared Hagrid and his hut, the eyes stopped where they were, 
staying very still in the gloom, watching. Do they really think that telling the great oaf would help them? They know nothing, not a damn thing. Such naivety, such ignorance, such fools, the lot of them. They'll end up dead, that's a certainty. If they were wise, they'd forget they ever saw anything at all. If they knew what was best for them, they'd stop and leave this place. But they've chosen their path. They've started something they cannot possibly finish. Fools! Fools, the lot of them. This was a huge mistake. And one which you'll all regret very soon. You'll get what's coming. Just you wait. Nothing can defeat it. You will all die. <laughs> So, tell me, you lot, what business do you have with the cellar? Why are you interested in what lies beyond there? You sat a little upright when Hagrid asked this, knowing that the eyes of the others were drifting towards you to tell him what? He obviously didn't know. You'd actually supposed that Dumbledore would have told Hagrid everything about how the Philosopher's Stone came to hiding within Hogwarts. However, he'd obviously omitted a couple of details, perhaps for your own protection. Well, Hagrid, we all know about the stone. Hagrid's eyes widened beneath bushy eyebrows as he paused the stirring of the hot water in the stove in the process. You... You know about the stone. Well, how the bloody hell did that happen? And in that moment, you told him everything. Everything from leaving your home in Paris with Nicolas Flamel to venturing out to King's Cross and to seeing the Hogwarts Express for the very first time. But all the while, carrying the stone to safety. And then, in the spirit of aiding the protection of yourself as well as the stone, the other three had been informed of proceedings to create a circle of knowledge and trust between them. No one else knew. Well, until now, that was. 
but you had to tell Hagrid. The stone was evidently in danger, and Hagrid was one of the only people who knew everything about Hogwarts grounds. He was also one of the only other people they all trusted. Blimey. Well, I was not expecting that. No one seems to tell me anything anymore. Ain't that right, Norbert? Everyone looked across to the corner of the room by the hearth to see Norbert the dragon now inside and cuddled up to the fireplace as close as he possibly could without actually being in the fire. Despite not breathing fire yet, the wee dragon still had a very warm heart, so to speak, and he easily felt the cold. Ron, who was nearest, looked upon the dragon with a slight grimace in his expression. I still don't trust that thing. They all grow up to be savage beasts in the end. Harry interjected. I wouldn't say that, Ron. Your brothers have had pretty friendly encounters, haven't they? Didn't Percy even tame one himself? It shot fire at George and burnt his trousers, Harry. Oh, stop your bickering, boys. Hermione challenged the pair of them. We don't have time for this at all. We have to get to the cellar as soon as we can. We've already used enough time coming here. Hagrid, can you take us there? You know this place better than anyone, and we'd all feel a lot better if you came with us, at least for now. Hagrid worried and pondered for a moment. He was not entirely convinced of this situation. So, tell me again, what you're saying is that someone is skulking about the school. No, 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 the cellar right now. And you think it's Professor Quirrell who's after the Philosopher's Stone. And you want to go after him and stop him. Well, yes, that's pretty much it, said Hermione. Again, Hagrid thought long and hard about what he was hearing. Something still worried him, that was for sure. His eyes were vacant and troubled. But after a while, he agreed. All right, I'll come with you. But it weren't me I was thinking over. It's you lot. The cellar. You don't know anything about what lies behind that door. Things you ain't never seen before. Dark magic which can do a load of great harm. The last things I'd ever want was for you lot to go down there, but... It seems like an emergency to me. I'm reluctant to say. 
I will come with you. I have to insist that, yes. The four of you sat, hugging your mugs with your hands, gazing at Hagrid and appreciating his sincerity. He was a wonderful man, and you all felt such enormous gratitude towards this warmest of giants. So, Hagrid, these things in the cellar, what are they exactly? I'll tell you on the way. Now, come on. We've not got much time. The five of you hurried back across the grounds of the school, with big old Hagrid leading the way, one giant step after another. As usual, you pretty much had to jog to keep up with him. The day had turned a little murkier and moodier since the lovely fresh morning, and something hung in the air, or perhaps it was the change in light. It felt different, but not really in a good way, necessarily, though you couldn't put your finger on what or why. You rounded the corner of the Great Hall, heading for the greenhouses and herbology classroom from where you'd came earlier. But to reach there, you had to pass the Whomping Willow, the great bludgeoning tree that took no mercy. You gave it a wide berth, for its reach and club-like force didn't care who you were or how saintly your conscience. It would womp and wallop with all its might should one stray too close. Next. The grass and gravel from the borders of the west wing turned to cobblestones as you crossed beneath the archway entrance to the courtyard. Your hurried footsteps could be heard echoing all around, and a few onlookers diverted their attention towards you. With a hushed tone, Hermione slid the key question back towards Hagrid. So, Hagrid, what is behind the door to the cellar? We need to know what we're up against, you know that. Oh, it's too public here, Miss Granger. Just hang on a minute, or... But before his words could even finish, the present company was sharply interrupted from an intercepting Madame Rolanda Hooch, your flying instructor and Quidditch teacher, 
crossing the courtyard ahead. She clocked you and turned a heel on your direction. She was a mildly terrifying looking woman with short, spiky grey hair and the sternest pursed lips to tell anyone who was boss. Sharp and to the point, she did not take kindly to miscommunications or any faffery. Excuse me, you three, where do you think you're off to? Madam Hooch asked sternly. No, not you, Miss Granger. The others. Why on earth aren't you changed, or at least in the vicinity of the locker rooms? Oh no, of course. It had completely slipped your mind after everything that had happened. The Interhouse Cup. It was today. Yourself, Ron and Harry glared at each other with the same look of panic. They'd clearly forgotten too. Reading the situation, Hagrid cleared his throat and tried his best to divert her concern. Well, good afternoon, Madam Hooch. A lovely day, isn't it? Um, I was just off to um, show these young students the greenhouses. They've, they've got an, they've got an assignment and we're needing a bit of helpful expertise on the mandrake plants. Very important. Though I appreciate you looking out for the welfare of these students and their education, they are required immediately in the Gryffindor dressing room. They have a Quidditch match to play. However, play does not mean all fun. This is your cup game against Slytherin. Weasley, your keeping skills better be on point today. I expect nothing less than the best. Potter, I need the sharpest and keenest eye for the snitch. Nothing else will do. And you, she said to you, with a slight upturn on her lips. You have been one of our most important and reliable chasers this season. Don't let us down now. Hermione and Hagrid looked desperate, but knew this had to be conceded. The five of you nodded, knowing they would again have to wait. The whole school would be asking questions if three of Gryffindor's team didn't show up to the game, and it could risk endangering everyone for all they knew. You had to do this. It felt like the safest bet, even in the circumstances. Besides, whoever won, it would certainly draw the attention away from the sellers. But maybe the game was the perfect distraction for Quirrell to escape with the stone. It was a risk they'd have to take. There was no time to waste.
the thunder of drums and chanting crept in through the crack in the door in front of you. Your team and that of Slytherins were lined up in single file, brooms in hand, waiting in the pitch tunnel. All thoughts of earlier in the day had vacated your mind, for little could stifle the nerves of a pre-game build-up. Ron and Harry were standing behind you, feeling equally apprehensive. You felt a gloved hand of reassurance squeeze your shoulder as Harry smiled anxiously in support. You were all dressed head to toe in Gryffindor's sporting attire. Leather headguard, which was crucial against soaring bludgers. Armoured shoulder pads and leather vest. Your numbered red vest with gold flashing. Navy underlayers and vast and elegant Quidditch robe. The stamping of the excited crowds above rumbled through the ground, and you swallowed the nerves away. To your left, in single file like yourselves, were Slytherin. They usually looked menacing and devious, but especially so when dressed for battle. They weren't a pretty bunch either. You were up against Oliver Rivers and Blaze Zabini, the chasers. It was the chaser's job to score points in the goal using the quaffle ball, and there was only one in play. Gregory Goyle and Vincent Crabbe were their beaters, and you'd have to do everything possible to stay away from them and the bludgers they'd be thwacking in your direction. If you got hit by one of those bludgers, not only could they badly hurt and potentially dismount you, you would have to drop whatever you were doing and race back to touch your own goal before being allowed to re-enter play. Then there was none other than the slimy and vile Draco Malfoy in the role of Seeker. The less said about him, the better. But Harry, who was Gryffindor's Seeker, certainly had his work cut out for him. It was the role of the Seeker to find and catch the elusive and rapid Golden Snitch. If they managed this, their team would score 150 points, and the game would end upon its capture. Harry and Malfoy exchanged a look which told of a stormy past.
after a tense moment, the doors finally opened and you all walked out into a cacophony of noise as you were met by hundreds of cheering students and teachers, all nestled in the watch stands high above, dressed in colourful scarves and banners matching their respective houses. Madame Hooch was already hovering centre pitch on her own broom. All the players mounted theirs and soared into the air, assuming their positions. You swept up past the grandstands, putting on a little pre-game show for the spectators. You saw Hermione and Hagrid waving down below, and it calmed your nerves slightly as you waved back, but you quickly focused up and composed yourself. You adjusted yourself on your broom and waited for the match to begin. Madame Hooch landed and walked into the centre of the pitch, addressing the players hovering above in a circle. Now I want a nice clean game from all of you. Following this, she stepped towards a buckled chest on the ground, gave it a firm kick, and up from within flew the two bludgers, swiftly followed by the enchanted, winged golden snitch. It zipped this way and that way, and then disappeared at the speed of light into the sky to hide. She then grasped the quaffle with both hands, steadied herself, then threw it into the air. This was it. The game had begun. You knew the drill. You'd practiced it a thousand times. Making an early lunge for the quaffle, you stretched an arm and swiped it from under the nose of the Slytherin team, shooting off in a spiral towards the edge of the field. All the other players zoomed off, batting bludgers, chasing marked men, and generally making a nuisance of themselves to the other team in whatever way they could. Quaffle under one arm, broomstick gripped tightly in the other, you ducked and weaved around the opposition, diving and dicing through any gaps you saw. The air rushed past you so fast, 
It whistled in your ears. In your peripheral vision, you saw an incoming tackle, and to the other side, Slytherin's Gregory Goyle thumped a bludger in your direction. Waiting, but at the last second, you spun on your axis and climbed high, creating a collision course between the tackler and the bludger. A moment later, you twisted around to see the two come together in a massive great thud. You laughed out loud. Good play. Now, throw them a dummy. You clocked another teammate chaser following alongside in support. It was Ginny Weasley, Ron's sister, solid hands. You twisted at the waist as you neared a grandstand and tossed the ball to Ginny just before you split either side of the tower. This threw off a pursuer who assumed chase with Ginny. But Ginny was wise and she knew the procedure. You reappeared on the far side of the tower to see the quaffle already mid-flight coming back towards you. You caught it after only a fraction of a second of seeing it again. Slytherin's Oliver Rivers had hardly even made ground towards Ginny before it was already back in your hands. This was the moment. You neared the tallest of the three goals round hoops on giant posts, and so, free of any immediate threat, you shot from medium range, with only a beater nearing your tail, barging you a while after sending the quaffle. Through the air it flew, arcing gently in the breeze. A moment of silence seemed to fall. Then that moment stretched. It seemed to last forever. The whole stadium held its breath. Then the quaffle whooshed through the hoop. And the whole place erupted in cheers and joy. You turned and nodded to Ginny, who smiled and nodded back, her fiery hair fluttering in the wind. One down. Ten points. Over the next twenty minutes or so, the game got dirtier. The rulebook seemed to have been thrown out or lost altogether. Gryffindor were a player down after having taken a bludger high on the chest, and two Slytherin chasers were doing their best impression of airborne battering rams. You were pushed this way, shoved that way, and even got a couple of nasty hits from the quaffle. 
high above, you saw Harry jostling with Malfoy in a dogfight, in which you assumed the snitch was nestled somewhere. The score was 50 to 30 in Gryffindor's favour. Hundreds of students cheered you on. You were getting there. Surely not that long now. But then, just as you were chasing down the quaffle, which was in the hands of Slytherin, you noticed something very alarming chasing you. It was no player, but a bludger. But there was no one to have thrown it or hit it, and it was coming for you fast. You faked a turn right, but ducked left and upwards as if to come back on yourself. But the bludger followed, defying all gravity. What kind of cursed play was this? Was someone trying to get you killed? Pressing on, tucking low, you sped up and tried to lose the enchanted projectile. But you simply couldn't shake it or outrun it, and it clattered into your shoulder. Such was the force of this, you nearly lost grasp of your broom. Shouting in pain and protest, you gestured towards Madame Hooch to reconcile this situation, but she was focused elsewhere. What was doing this? Or who? Down below, in one of Gryffindor's stands, Hermione had seen this happen, and then herself noticed something troubling and rather sinister. In the neighbouring stand, nestled among the students, was a ghostly hooded figure heart raced and a cold sweat broke out over her. The figure was side on, staring out and up into the game, not moving a single inch. It seemed entranced, focused, intent on something. Piloting a bludger, perhaps. There was something frightening about the proportions of this thing. It didn't look normal. But the most odd thing was that no one else seemed to have noticed them. They all looked out onto the gameplay, laughing and cheering. It was as if this thing was invisible to them. Hermione had a plan and never did she think she'd need it in these circumstances. But from her robe, she drew her wand and fluttered it towards the figure 
uttering the words Tarantallegra. With absolute precision and concentration, she aimed her spell towards where the thing's feet would be, and immediately it began to shuffle and dance uncontrollably on the spot. Ah yes, a dancing feet spell. Who knew it would come in so handy? She said, smirking at the sight of this bizarre and grotesque shadow thing as it burst into a comedic display. It looked down at its feet, then around itself in confusion and obviously panicking. Hermione urged the hood to fall. Come on, fall, fall, show yourself. But before it could, and just as other students began to sense something happening near to them, in a swift arc of black fabric, the ghostly figure just disappeared into thin air. Everyone around blinked in confusion, as though they knew something had just happened, but they couldn't tell you what. They were spellbound, or more, had been spellbound. After a couple of seconds, a particularly harsh tackle summoned a stadium-wide gasp, followed by some loud boos. Hermione didn't notice that. She just stood there, blank-faced, not quite able to understand what she'd just seen. Above her, Hagrid looked on also, having quietly seen it all unfold too. There was real apprehension in his eyes. There was evil here, and they knew it. The only reconciliation they had was seeing you hovering overhead, gazing down, untroubled by the flying bludger. A moment or so later, a great whistle blew long and hard. The crowd erupted again. But this time, it was a dissonant mix of cheers and disappointed outrage. Pinned in space, and clutching your broom, you looked up to see, way above, the black and green robes and slick blonde hair of Malfoy. He was clutching the golden snitch in his hand. The game was over. Slytherin had won.
on earth was that, Hagrid? Hermione asked as the five of you rushed through the lower corridors of the astronomy tower. I honestly don't know, Miss Granger. But whatever it was, it was up to no good. It looked like a cross between a man and... and a... A what, Hagrid? Probed Ron, who was still pulling the last of his game uniform from his body. I hate to say this, but... It looked like a Dementor. A Dementor? You all shouted in unison. You lot keep your voices down. We're not supposed to be going where we're going. It just looked like it, is all. We don't know anything yet. But I'm starting to get quite worried. I think we're best telling Dumbledore what we saw. Not yet, Hermione said. We have to find out what Quirrell wants first. We can do that ourselves. But we need your help, Hagrid. He obviously knows we're onto him if he's got help or an accomplice of some kind. Presently, you all rounded the last corner before settling eyes on the cellar door once again. Upon approach, Ron tried the latch. It was still locked solid, just as he left it. That meant that Quirrell was likely still down there. It felt unnerving seeing it again, knowing that nothing good lay beyond it. What would they find? Would they find the Professor and catch him red-handed? Or would they find worse? You had no idea. Is this it then? Said Ron. Are we actually going down there now? Seems like it. Said Harry who was nursing a bandaged, quidditch induced wound on his wrist. You drew your delicate wand from inside your robe pocket preparing to unlock the previously locked door. But you stopped just short and turned to Hagrid. You still haven't told us what's down there yet, Hagrid. He sighed a great chesty sigh and scanned the four of you down below him. He was thinking both with his head and his heart. His eyes gave the latter away. Perhaps it's best I just show you. Now, you promise You'll be careful. I couldn't live with myself if anything came to harm you. You all nodded, feeling rather grateful to have him there. You'd be okay. You had Hagrid. 
turning back to the lock, hand outreached, he whispered, Alohomora. The door clunked a loud metallic clunk, and the lock fell away in your other hand. You gave the latch a press, and the heavy cellar door swung inwards with a creak. Beyond it, stone steps descended as far as you could see, melting into the darkness. An eerie resonance chattered far away. It sounded like the cellar went on forever. With nervous glances all around, Hagrid took the lead and stooped under the door and stepped inside. The rest of you followed one by one. You waited until last, hesitating a little, pulling the door shut behind you.